Hello students, welcome to AKS IAS. In this lecture, we will be dealing with the current affairs related to economy for the month of July 2020. The article number one says that it's time for a universal basic income program in India. So what is the context of this? The ongoing crisis that is the COVID-19 crisis is creating changes that could end up dividing society into pre and post COVID days. These changes are also likely to exacerbate the novel challenges accompanying the fourth industrial revolution. So here there's a need for gaining productivity through artificial intelligence. Today, disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence are ushering in productivity gains that we have never seen before. They also steadily reduce human capital requirements, thus making jobs a premium. A microcosm of these trends can be seen in the Silicon Valley. The region is home to five of the world's eight most valuable companies. These giants, all the technological companies, have a cumulative market cap of over four trillion US dollars, yet they together directly employ just 1.2 million people. So here you can see, though these major companies are supposed to have a greater economical share in the market, the size of their employability is abysmally low. That is what is the author trying to say over here. Next. So now we will try to understand how universal basic income can be a tool to eradicate poverty. Many consider a universal basic income program to be a solution that could mitigate the looming crisis caused by the dwindling job opportunities. UBI is also deliberated as an effective poverty eradication tool. Supporters of the scheme include various Nobel laureates like Peter Diamond and Christopher Pissarites and tech leaders Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. UBI in its true sense would entail the provision of an unconditional, please remember this, unconditional fixed amount to every citizen in the country. Nevertheless, the countries across the world, including Kenya, Brazil, Finland and Switzerland have brought into this concept and have begun controlled UBI pilots to supplement their population. However, India's huge capacity and infrastructure building requirements will support plenty of hands in the foreseeable future. Nonetheless, even before the pandemic, India was struggling to find enough opportunities for more than a million job aspirants who are entering the job market each month. So you can understand the quantum of the situation. Like every month, at least 1 million people, that is approximately 10 lakh people, are entering the job market, but there are no required, requisite positions for them in the job market. The economic survey of the year 2016 to 17 and the International Monetary Fund had once proposed quasi basic income schemes that leave out the well-off top quarantile of the population as an effective means of alleviating poverty and hunger. The fiscal cost of a UBI pegged at rupees 7,620 at 75% universality was 4.9% of the GDP. A UBI on par with the numbers suggested by the economic survey could lead to targeted household incomes increasing by almost 40,000 per annum since the average Indian household is approximately consists of five persons. The political will was nonetheless lukewarm because of the costs involved. Requirements to trim some of the existing subsidies 
to balance the resultant deficit were also difficult political minefields for then government. So the proposition was finally shelved. However, the times have changed now. The times are now of the times are now very different. IMF has projected global growth in 2020 to be minus 3%, the worst since the Great Depression. India is projected to grow at only 1.9%. The US economy is expected to fall by at least 5.9%. The unemployment rate and the unemployment claims in the US since President Donald Trump declared a national emergency is the highest since the Great Depression. Unfortunately, India does not even have comparable data. So what is the way forward for us in this crisis situation? Lockdowns in some format are expected to be the norm till the arrival of the COVID vaccine. With almost 90% of the India's workforce in the informal sector, informal sector without minimum wages or social security, the micro level circumstances will be worse in India than anywhere else. So this is the peculiar situation in India where 90% of the workforce is engaged in informal sector. By informal sector, we mean that the characteristics include lack of minimum wages or any kind of social security. The frequent sight of several thousands of migrant work laborers undertaking perilous journeys on foot in the inhuman conditions is a disgraceful blight on India. So what is the conclusion that the author draws? The author says that one way to ensure their sustenance through these trying times is the introduction of unconditional regular paychecks at maximum universal universality, at least till the economy normalizes. If the UBI ever had a time, it is now. Okay, so that is about why union, universal basic income is a necessity given the present circumstances. The next article that we got we got to discuss is Cabinet Committee OKs 5,000, sorry, Cabinet Committee OKs 50,000 crore rupees infusion for MSMEs. What is the context of this? Several steps have been taken towards facilitating ease of doing business in the MSME sector in order to help in attracting investments and creating more jobs in the sector. The Cabinet Committee on Economic, Economic Affairs approved 50,000 crore equity infusion for MSMEs with the aim to help enhance capacity while also encouraging them to get listed. The government will set up 10,000 crore fund which will leverage and will be able to finance equity infusion of about 50,000 crores in small businesses. The move is expected to expand size as well as capacity of MSMEs and will encourage them to get listed on the main board of domestic bourses. Besides, approval was given for a subordinate debt of 20,000 crore rupees to provide equity support to the stressed MSMEs. This is likely to benefit at least 2 lakh MSMEs. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, which is headed by the Prime Minister of India, also approved the new definition, new definition of MSMEs, thereby increasing the investment limit to 50 crore rupees and turnover to 250 crore for medium enterprises. The new definition will not only distinguish between manufacturing and service sector, but also lay down certain criteria which are going to cater to the sector specifically. The micro enterprises, the investment limit would be rupees 1 crore and the turnover would be 5 crore. While for small enterprises, the investment limit would be 10 crore and the turnover would be 50 crore. This is the criteria laid down by the government. It, uh, it has also been decided that the turnover with respect to the exports will not be counted in the limits of the turnover of any category of MSME units, be it micro, small or medium. So the next article that we have to discuss is can allow non-profit organizations 
to list on social stock exchanges. What is the context for this article? A working group consisting of Securities and Exchange Board of India, CB, on social stock exchanges has recommended allowing non-profit organizations to directly list on such platforms while allowing certain tax incentives to encourage participation on the platform. Let us get into the details of this. According to a release issued by the Capital Markets Regulator, the group has recommended allowing non-profit organizations to directly list through issuance of bonds while recommending a range of funding avenues. The idea of social stock exchange for listing of social enterprise and voluntary organizations was mooted by the finance minister while presenting the union budget 2019 to 20. It was announced for social enterprises and voluntary organizations working for social welfare to help them raise capital through debt, equity and mutual funds. What are the suggestions of this working group? The group has suggested new minimum reporting standard for organizations. Okay, it also suggested that for-profit social enterprises be allowed to list on the platform but with enhanced reporting requirements. It also suggested that the social stock exchanges can be housed within the existing national bourses like the Bombay Stock Exchange and the National Stock Exchange. This will help the SSEs leverage existing infrastructure and client relationships of the exchanges to onboard investors, donors, and social enterprises. So what is the social stock exchange? A social stock exchange is a platform which allows investors to buy shares in social enterprises vetted by an official exchange. These exchanges would provide a platform where investors would invest in social enterprises authorized by an exchange, which would be sharing with the public the details of their activities and investments in a transparent manner. Next, Periodic Labor Force Survey of 2018 to 19. Recently, the National Statistics Office, please remember these kind of facts because these could be important questions in your prelims examination, whereby they could give you a statement stating that the Periodic Labor Force Survey is released by which of the following and among them, the National Statistics Office could be the right answer. So let us look into the details of this. Unemployment rate. Regarding the unemployment rate in India, according to the periodic labor force survey, the unemployment rate fell to 5.8% during the year 2018 to 19 from 6.1% during the same period in the year 2017 to 18. Within the unemployment rate, the urban unemployment rate reduced to 7.7% from 7.8%. The rural unemployment rate reduced to 5.5% from 5.3%. So you can see that the rural unemployment rate has reduced to a greater extent than the urban unemployment rate. Next, regarding the labor force participation rate. The labor force participation rate rose to 37.5% during the years 2018 to 19 from 36.9% in the year 2017 to 18. Also, the female participation rate has improved going up to 18.6% in the year 2018 to 19. Next, regarding the worker population ratio, this has also increased to 35.3%. So what are the issues involved from this survey? Unemployment was a concern in 2019 and it worsened in the year 2019 to 20 due to COVID-19. According to the monthly Center for Monitoring Indian Economy data, the unemployment rate in India shot up from 7.87% in the year 2019 for the month of June to 23.48% in the month of May of 2020. You can see the phenomenal rise in the unemployment rate according to this data. The speed, what is this periodic labor force survey? It is India's first computer-based survey 
launched by the NSO that is the National Statistical Office in the year 2017. It has been constituted based on the recommendation of Amitabh Kundu. This periodic labor force survey has twofold objectives. Number one is to estimate the key employment and unemployment indicators such as the worker population ratio, LFPR unemployment rate in the short term interval of three months for the urban areas only in the current weekly status. The number two is to estimate unemployment and employment indicators in both usual status and the current weekly status in both the rural and urban areas annually. So before the before this periodic labor force survey, the NSSO, which was the previous name of NSO, used to bring the data related to employment and unemployment based on quinquennial household socioeconomic survey programs. So this was the recent change. So the recent government initiatives to tackle unemployment. Now let us look into the various initiatives taken up by the government to tackle the problem of rising unemployment in India. The union government has recently come up with an economic stimulus package under the Atma Nirbhar Bharat to support the Indian economy and to create meaningful jobs. Under the Prana Pradhan Mantri's Street Vendors Atma Nirbhar Nidhi, that is a PM SVA Nidhi, the union government is providing affordable loans to street vendors. The government has also allocated an additional fund of 40,000 crore for the MGNREGA as part of the stimulus package. The government is offering credit guarantees for the MSMEs, which will help them in getting loans easily and boost their functioning. Various other initiatives have also been taken by the government to support the economy, which includes relaxations in the Company Act and insolvency proceedings, reforms in agri-marketing, etc. State governments have also come up with the initiative to support their economy and increase the jobs. Such as, for instance, you can take Andhra Pradesh government's restart program to support the MSME sector in the state of Andhra. Jharkhand has launched three employment schemes create wage employment for workers in rural areas. Next, cabinet sets up secretaries group to attract investment. The union cabinet has recently approved the setting up of an empowered group of secretaries and project development cells PDCs in the ministries and de departments of central government for attracting investments to India. Let us look into the details of this. Industries are thinking to diversify their investments in different localities so as to ensure that investment is enhanced in India. Thus, an EGOS, that is the Empowered Group of Secretaries, has been formed. It will make India a more investor-friendly destination and give a fillip to the mission of Atmanirbhar Bharat by hand-holding and further smoothening investment inflows in the country. The two decisions are expected to help domestic industries and lead to direct and indirect employment. So this is the benefit of this move by the union government. What are these empowered group of secretaries? The EGOS would be chaired by the cabinet secretary of the union government. It would include the secretary of the department of the promotion of industry and internal trade as the convener member, the NITI IOC CEO, the Commerce Secretary, the Revenue Secretary, and the F Economic Affairs Secretary would also be the members of the empowered group of secretaries. The secretaries of the department concerned would be co opted depending on that particular project. What are the objectives of this? The objectives of the EGOS is to bring synergies and ensure timely clearances from different departments and ministries. Number two is to attract increased investments into India and provide investment support and facilitation to global investors. Number three is to facilitate investments of top investors in a targeted manner 
and assure policy stability and consistency in the overall investment environment. Now let us try to understand what are these project development cells. In every ministry, there would be a PDC. This will make India a more investor-friendly destination and there will be hand-holding of the new industries. The PDC was approved for the development of investable projects in coordination between the central and state governments. Okay, so the cell is aimed at creating projects with all approvals, land available for allocation with the complete DPRs for adoption or investment by investors and to identify issues that need to be resolved in order to attract and finalize the investments and put forth before the empowered group. So the next article is cabinet nod for agri-marketing reforms. What is the context of this? The union cabinet has recently approved an amendment to the 65 year old Essential Commodities Act. Regarding the Essential Commodities Act, we have already dealt with in our July Current Affairs Quality Module. So, however, we will be having a brief look at what exactly was the you know change regarding the cabinet on agri-marketing reforms. The cabinet also approved ordinances to remove restrictions on farmers selling their produce outside the notified market yards as well as to facilitate contract farming and allow farmers to engage in direct marketing. Okay, now let us look into the details of this. The amendment will be made effective immediately via an ordinance according to the Agricultural Ministry. So as you all know that the ECA, that is the Essential Commodities Act, empowers the government to impose curbs on stocking of farm produce. This amendment to ECA, which has been under discussion for more than a decade, will deregulate, please note this, the production, storage, movement and distribution of these food commodities by removing the private sector's fears of excessive regulatory interference the central government hopes to increase private and foreign investment especially in cold storage facilities and modernization of the food supply chain according to the government even as india has become surplus in most agri commodities farmers have been unable to get better prices due to lack of investment in cold storage processing and export adequate processing and storage facilities will reduce the wastage thereby increasing the income for the farmers okay because most of these you know agro produce are perishable commodities and if they are properly stored and transported it will lead to a lot of logistic support to the farmers and reduce the logistics cost the amendment would remove cereals, pulses, oil seeds, edible oils, onions, potatoes from the list of essential commodities. However, to protect the consumers, the amendment allows regulation during extraordinary circumstances like war, famine, price rise, which is extraordinary in nature, and natural calamities, while providing exemptions for exporters and processors at such times as well. So even during these exceptional or extraordinary circumstances, Exporters and processors are exempted. So let us look into the details of this farming produce trade and commerce promotion and facilitation ordinance 2020. It aims to open up agricultural marketing outside the notified mandis for farmers. See until now these particular commodities which are notified have to be traded only within the mandis that have been notified by the government okay but now with this ordinance the farmer is free to sell his produce even outside the notified mandis so this gives a discretion to the farmer and it might lead to a better price discovery for their produce it will help in creating one agriculture market across the country wherein farmers and traders will enjoy freedom of choice of sale and purchase of agricultural produce it will also allow for hassle-free interstate and intrastate trade in agricultural produce. While both the agriculture and market are state subjects, 
Okay, please remember this. Under Schedule 7 of the Constitution, agriculture and the marketing of agricultural produce are state subjects. The center is counting on the fact that the trade and commerce and foodstuffs is part of the concurrent list to push through this ordinance. Industry sources suggest that 60% of the agricultural trade has already taken place outside the mandis presently through unregulated sales. By legalizing and facilitating such sales, the center hopes that farmers will, bet, will benefit rather than the middlemen. It is believed that allowing the farmer more choices will raise his income and reduce the wastage and also improve the quality of the produce. Not all the states have been on board with these reforms, especially as the state governments will not be allowed to levy fees on these sales. Next, this Farmers Empowered Protect Empowerment and Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services Ordinance 2020. What are the details of this? Recently, this ordinance was passed so as to facilitate contract farming where a private buyer contracts to purchase a crop at a certain price at the beginning of a season. The ordinance empowers farmers to engage with processors, aggregators, wholesalers, large retailers, and also exporters. This would facilitate transferring the risk of market unpredictability from the farmer to the corporate sponsor. Why? Because before the beginning of the season itself, as we looked, saw in the first point, the farmer will enter into a purchase contract or a you know contract with a private buyer. It would help attract private investments to the farm sector. However, farmers groups have expressed concern that corporates will benefit more than small farmers from such direct marketing measures. Next, border adjustment tax. Recently, a Niti Aayog member has favored imposing, imposing a border adjustment tax on imports to provide a level playing field to domestic industries. This suggestion comes in the backdrop of US-China trade tensions, which are expected to rise even further post the COVID-19 situation. The border adjustment tax is a duty that is to be imposed on imported goods in addition to the customs levy that gets charged at the port of entry. BAT is a fiscal measure that imposes a charge on goods or services in accordance with the destination principle of taxation. Under this principle, a government taxes products based on the location of their sale to the final consumer rather than the on the location of their production or origin. So here, remember that the government taxation is based on the location of their sale to the final consumer. That is the difference. Thus, to adjust a tax at the border, a country taxes import taxes imported products and domestically produced products sold on its markets on the same basis and at the same rate and exempts from this tax products exported for sale to foreign consumers. Generally, BAT seeks to promote equal conditions of competition for foreign and domestic companies supplying products or services within a taxing jurisdiction. The WTO rules allow for adjustment of certain types of internal taxes at the border under certain conditions like the tax must be applied equally to imports and like domestic products. The tax must be borne by a product and not be direct. A permitted border tax adjustment must not subsidize exports. So that is about the border adjustment tax. However, if you look at the impact of the BAT on trading partners, at a macro level with imports reduced and exports increased, a country can cut, cut its trade deficit. If a country is a major export market for many developing countries, the tax plan will have serious adverse effects on them after implementation. 
BAT may render some firms less profitable and if the prices are forced upwards, they may lose competitiveness and substitutes product or locally made similar products. So this BAT in this context, it was highlighted that advocating self-reliance under Atma Nirbhar Bharat vision should not imply that India was, would embrace isolationist policies. India has to go global. India has to go global, but with the supply chain, which is more local. Okay. Next, the government banks disperse 16,000 crore rupees to MSMEs. The finance ministry has said that the public sector banks have dis dispersed approximately 16,031 crore rupees till June 12 under the 3 lakh crore emergency line of credit guarantee scheme for the MSME sector. The emergency credit line guarantee scheme is a biggest fiscal component of the 20 lakh crore Atman Irbhar Bharat Abhiyan package announced by the finance minister. Under the scheme, 100% guarantee coverage will be provided by the National Credit Guarantee Trustee Company for an additional funding of up to 3 lakh crore to eligible MSMEs and interested micro units development and refinance agency borrowers in the form of guaranteed emergency credit line facility. For this purpose, a corpus of 41,000 crore was provided by the government spread over the current and next three financial years. Next, World Investment Report, UNCTAD. Recently, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Release the World Investment Report. Please remember these kind of facts for your prelims examination. The World Investment Report is released by UNCTAD. This is, that is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. It was established in the year 1964 to promote development friendly integration and developing countries into the world economy. So it tries to promote the integration of the world economy. UNCTAD is a permanent intergovernmental body headquartered at Geneva in Switzerland. Please remember these facts and try to focus these facts for the prelims examination. So this World Investment Report focuses on trends in foreign direct investment worldwide at the regional and country levels and emerging measures to improve to improve its contribution to development what is the global scenario according to the report the global fdi flows are forecast to decrease by up to 40 percent in the year 2020 from their 2019 value of 1.54 trillion dollars this would bring global fdi below 1 trillion dollar for the first time since the year 2005 Developing countries are expected to see the biggest fall in FDI because they rely more on investment in the global value chain based industries, which have been severely hit due to the COVID-19 pandemic. They have also not been able to put in place the same economic support measures as developed economies. However, the investment flows are expected to slowly recover by the start of 2022. The global FDI flows rose modestly in the year 2019 following the sizable declines registered in the years 2017 and 18. The rise in FDI in the year 2019 was due to the waning of the impact of the 2009, 2017 tax reforms in the United States of America. Now let us have a look at India's investment scenario. India jumped from the 12th position in 2018 to 9th position in 2019 
among the world's largest FDI recipients. Now you can see that lot of investment has been coming into India in the year 2019. In the year 2019, the FDI inflows in India jumped over 20% to about $51 billion. The report also observed that the FDI into India may decline sharply in the year 2020 because of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent lockdown measures, supply chain disruptions and economic slowdown. Okay. In India, the number of greenfield investment announcements declined by 4% in the first quarter of the financial year. The mergers and acquisitions also contracted by 58%. What is a greenfield investment? A greenfield investment is a type of FDI in which a parent company creates a subsidiary in a different company, in a different country, sorry, building its operations from the ground up. However, the report mentioned that India's large market will continue to attract market seeking investments into the country. The next point is that India's professional services and the digital economy could see a faster rebound as global venture capital firms and technology companies continue to show interest in India's market through acquisitions. Investors conclude deals worth over $650 million in the first quarter of 2020, mostly in the digital sector. So if you look at the report, the scenario across the globe and for India is bleak in the year 2020. However, there are definitely some green shots post this 2020 crisis is what is the optimism reflected in the report that is a world investment report. So that was about the economy current affairs for the month of June as part of our AKS IAS magazine of July current affairs. So to, to download this magazine and to participate in daily quiz, please log into AKS IAS Edunation mobile app. This app is available on Google Play Store and Apple iStore. Thank you. Have a good day.